So welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to the talks. We've had uh, two talks of the eight lecture series that um, were um, very unusual circumstances. <laughs> um, a year ago, when we were doing talks of this uh, for this for the last series, we had an average of 45 people in every talk. Um, but thank you for coming, and um, welcome. If there's the fire alarm or the loud noise goes off, which means run for it. Don't go that way, please. Go this way, and we've opened the door all the way down into the yard. So that's the escape room if something happens, which I doubt very much. And you get bored halfway through. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, we um, uh, welcome uh, Father Peter Owens. He um, has kindly, I've talked to Peter and other people as well about the pilgrimage we're involved in it and he's kindly kept coming today. And I don't know, Peter, I haven't got the title of your talk, but is your talk um, Pilgrim Roots, Kingsley Walls and Inns? That's it, yep. There we are. Mm -hmm. It's Pilgrim, Pilgrim Roots, Kingsley Walls and Inns. So um, we're looking forward to this. So Father Peter, welcome and thank you. Well, I, I begin with uh, two apologies, uh, really. One is that I'm not Tim MacDonald, who was supposed to be giving this talk. Uh, he's a very interesting speaker, lives in Walsingham himself. Uh, but hopefully he'll be on the, on the, spring, um, on the spring sessions uh, when things hopefully might be a bit easier. And, uh, and the second apology is that I'm talking about pilgrim routes uh, from King's City to Walsingham. And I have to confess, I've never actually walked it. I have walked from Brandon to Walsingham, and I've walked from Norwich to Walsingham, but uh, not these particular routes. Um, before the Reformation, you know, uh, Kingsley has always been a starting point for, for pilgrimages uh, to Walsingham. And before the Reformation, pilgrims from the, the Midlands and the North would converge on, on the Those from the South uh, very often would bypass Lynn because they would take the route uh, through Swatham and Fakenham. Unless, of course, they came by the way of the, uh, the present day 10, which would take them through Stowe Bardolph, mm -hmm. South Monkton, Setchley, Westwich, and Hardwick. Um, and that's interesting because the, the name Hardwick comes because there was actually a causeway there across, across the marshes. Um, for much of the journey this way, um, people had to be guided. By, by uh, especially local trade guides who knew their way across some of the treacherous sands and, and the marshes and so on. Others coming from the north would, would find the journey actually easier and safer to come by sea. Um, mm -hmm. So they would come down the, down the east coast from um, places like um, Hartlepool, Whitby, Hull and so on. Those who were walking from the north would come, as I say, by the way of the treacherous sands between Hull Beach and uh, Walpole Cross Keys. Um, and I think King John would have something to say about that particular area, if you've got the difficulties there. And they'd come by the way of Terrington St Clement and Clenchwarton to West Lynn. And halfway between Clenchwarton and um, West Lynn, at Jubilee Road, you find that there's some remains there of the Wayside Cross, uh, and these were stone crosses, sometimes about 15 feet, 20 feet, whatever height, uh, which marked the routes uh, from various directions uh, towards Walsingham. You'll find a collection of them um, outside the Folks Arms or, or, or the front entrance to um, Hillington Hall. If, if, if you've been on that way, you'll see those four things there. They, they, they're not in their proper place. They've been gathered from various places on Hillington Estate. Um, but that's the sort of thing uh, that was there. There's another one on the on the um, just at the entrance to the Sandringham Estate. You'll see one just in the in the, in the, the verge there, near, near where Prince Philip had his accident. <laughs> um, it's just it's just there you'll spot it there. So there were way, way markers uh, for people coming, and of course at West Lynn they they come across the river uh, by the ferry. Lynn would have been a place for them to stop, rest equip themselves, reprovision themselves and so on uh, in the various um, guest houses of the monasteries that were here, the five monasteries, and also many inns uh, and, and so on around the town. 
um, so we would have possibly spent a day or two here because again there was a lot to see while we were here because uh, when you went on pilgrimage it wasn't just a direct route to, to the holy place you were going to you'd make the most of all the places on your, on your way um, for a good old tour some people were away on pilgrimage for months and months at a time uh, so there's plenty to see in, in Lynn of course um, you know, the Minster, St Margaret's um, the priory churches were all substantial churches and, and, and full of things of interest in themselves and of course the Red Mount Chapel um, which was a great pilgrimage destination there. Well when the time came for, for moving on, having rested and refueled as it were, um, they would leave by the East Gate, which is just beside uh, where the Hob and the Well is now um, on the road there, the Hob Street, uh, East Gate Street. Um, it was built into the walls, of course bits of the walls are still there in the Hob and the Well and Kettlewell Lane. Uh, the gate itself still exists, um, it's uh, near Binghamton, just round the corner as you go to Flitchen, uh, it's there on the left hand side. Um, it's, it's in a bad state of repair actually. Um, it was moved because it was much lower than the south gate, uh, so when they were wanting to get traffic through it, and particularly I think it was the occasion when the paintings at Houghton were sold and brought to the docks in huge great crates, uh, obviously they wouldn't, couldn't get through the, through the arch. But it's, it's there at um, Philippton, and that would be a project for uh, the, the uh, local archaeological society or the town council or whatever to, to bring it back. And you could have put it exactly the place where it is on, on the road, obviously, but it could, there's, there's room to one side. Kettlewell Gardens there, I think it could be put back. The coat of arms from that gate, of course, is on the, um, the magistrate's court, um, the college lane there. So they leave by the East Gate, and just outside the East Gate, on, on their left, uh, was a chapel um, of, dedicated to St Catherine of Alexandria. And she's the patron saint of pilgrims, partly from the fact that she's buried on, on Mount Sinai um, there. But it's also significant because the Knights of St Catherine guarded the road to Nazareth in the Holy Land. And of course, Walsingham is known as England's Nazareth, and so there's a link there. And when they got to the other end of their journey, at the Slipper Chapel, that's also dedicated to uh, St Catherine of Alexandria. So they'd stop in there and say a prayer for a, a good journey and so on, and then cross over the Gaywood River and go past the Salt Pans, which is remembered in uh, Salter's Road. And there they'd see a marble cross which marked the boundary between Lynn uh, and Gaywood. And then they continue um, past St Mary Magdalene's Hospice, which is still there, um, almshouses uh, now. Um, so they go past there and down Wooden Road uh, to Wooden, and then on to Castle Rising and Hillington. And from there they'd go by way of Plitchum and Coxford, Dunton, Scowforth, North Barsham, and Houghton St Giles. Um, and then the last mile, which is known as the Holy Mile into Walsingham itself. Now they, they wouldn't do that in a day obviously, um, it, it's just about possible to do it in a day now with a, if you get a, a march on, um, but they would have taken probably a couple of days, two or three even days to do that and they would have stopped in, in priories um, in places like Fitchin and Coxford um, and uh, Scowforth I think, uh, they would have found hospitality there from the, from the uh, the monks that were living in those places there. And that was the, the, the classic route uh, to Walsing. So um, on the map there, the <coughs> um, I'm sort of going that way really. Over to Walsing itself, which is there, somewhere. Took a magnifier as well. Now at um <coughs> Uh, in the penal days, of course, pilgrimage ceased virtually. Uh, the shrine itself was destroyed. The Slipper Chapel, which had been the last stopping place on, on the route, uh, was turned to secular use. The building mercifully survived virtually intact, um, but it, it was put to other uses. It was a, a 
Fuller House for a while, it was a, a forge, it was a barn, it was a cow shed. Um, and there is a photograph from about the 1890s that actually shows some cows outside it. Um, and said so it was bought by, um, and it had a couple of cottages attached to it, um, but it was bought in 1894 by uh, a lady called Charlotte Boyd, who was interested in restoring monastic buildings. And she restored it. Um, but it remained unused you know, for the next 50 years or so. Real pilgrimage again uh, started after the war. Um, during the war, th this area of course was a restricted zone, a military zone. So anyone coming from outside uh, the area, even after the shrine, uh, the Anglican shrine had been restored in 1921 and the Catholic shrine in 1934, um, but then the war intervened and, and uh, pilgrims from outside the area were not allowed in. Although the military, um, based particularly at Scowthorpe, um, did, make, did make pilgrimages themselves. But it's really after the war that things, that things start up again. And the first significant um, one was in 1947. And this was uh, groups of students who walked from various university towns and each group uh, was called a leg, that's their name for it, <coughs> so the various legs um, coming <coughs> from various uh, university towns. And two of the legs, uh, the northern leg, uh, based on Sheffield I think, and the, the Midlands leg, uh, come through Lynn, usually arriving, or always arriving because they're, they're um, military planned. Um, always arriving on the Wednesday afternoon, the Wednesday uh, of Holy Week. Um, then they're aiming to be at the Slipper Chapel for the afternoon of Good Friday. So in modern times, they, they stay over, overnight in Holy Family Church in Cambridge, where uh, they have their feet washed and bandaged, and they're given a hot meal, and they get a shower and things like that, and then a breakfast to set them off in the morning, and off they go. But when they leave here, because they have the tradition of not all walking together, they keep each leg is separate and has a different route to Walsingham so that they, they, they can be discrete groups as it were and then converging on the Slipper Chapel on the afternoon of Good Friday. So the two that leave Lynn uh, go by, diff by different ways. Um, one group goes by way of South Wotton, Castle Rising, Snettisham, Sedgeford, Docking, North Creek, uh, that way. Uh, the other group uh, goes by way of Gaywood, uh, Mint Lynn, Ashwickham, Gayton, Great Massingham, mm. Hartley, East Rudham, Scowthorpe, and North Basham. Uh, and, and they come in like that. And um, I'll see that continues. This, this year is the, is the first year that, that they, haven't, they haven't been able to do it. But uh, otherwise, it's a well established tradition now in this area. Villagers know when the students will be coming through their village and, the, and they, they watch out to see them come and the sight of them carrying their cross against the skyline <coughs> in the fields in the uh, you know, March or April uh, a very evocative image and particularly the, the group that comes over the ferry because they usually stand their cross up on the ferry as it comes across the thing and uh, arrive yes at the ferry steps near the, near the Ouse Booze but sadly they don't go in <laughs> They normally, their lunch stop is normally the Victory at, um, at Trenchwater, which is now the, the Partridge or something, isn't it? I think they took over. Yeah. So that was 1947, the students um, began doing that. Then the following year, there was an enormous pilgrimage, um, a cross carrying pilgrimage. Um, and this was, again, a reaction to the war and the horrors that people had gone through. And it was a, a national act of penance and prayer and reparation um, and prayer for peace. Um, and it was largely servicemen that, um, that took it on. Um, particularly one chap uh, who'd been uh, an officer in the, the army, a fellow called Charles Osborne, uh, who previously had gone across to France to a place called Vézelay, uh, where there's a similar cross carrying tradition going on there and he got that idea and brought it back and set to and it was organised as you can imagine after the war uh, with military precision um, 
every detail was, was, was worked out and it was incredibly uh, successful. Uh, there were 14 crosses, each about um, seven foot tall, weighing about 90 pounds, so they're quite substantial bulk crosses. And they were equipped with, with um, sanctions, I think you call them, Trevor, struts, that could slot in to the, to the, to the, the upright. So it could be stood up in various hands when they stopped for their prayers or at stopping places and so on. Uh, Fourteen crosses because of the Catholic devotion of the Stations of the Cross, which is a sort of virtual um, journey in Jerusalem where Jesus goes from uh, Pontius Pilate's court through various stages until eventually arriving at, at Calvary. And if you go to Jerusalem, you can follow the Via Dolorosa, as it's called, these 14 stopping places um, and it became very popular particularly in the 14th century um, sponsored by the Franciscans to recreate that as it were in parish churches so you'll go into a Catholic church and you'll find 14 crosses around the walls or, and quite often with them 14 illustrations of the various stopping places so these 14 crosses uh, represented that and they were carried from all parts of the country um, I'm quite proud that my hometown, Middlesbrough, uh, had the longest journey. They came 236 miles uh, carrying, carrying that cross. And they came from Westminster, um, and from the northwest and southwest and so on, um, all parts of the country. Two of the crosses, again, they, they had their own routes, um, but two of them actually came through, through Lynn in 1948. And they were received into the Church of Our Lady on London Road the photographs of, of them arriving there. What was called the Twelfth Station, um, which in the, in the story is actually the crucifixion, the death of our Lord on the cross, the Twelfth Station of the cross, that began in Glossop. Um, and they came nearer here, they came by way of Wisbeach and Tilney. And then from here, they went on by way of Castle Rising, Dersingham, Monsanto and Docking. And the 13th station, uh, which is the one where Jesus is taken down from the cross and placed in the arms of his mother, um, that began in Leeds. And that came by way of Long Sutton, Terrington, Trenchwater. And then from here, they went by way of Castle Rising again, Dursingham, Monsanto. But then they, they branched off uh, through Winstead, um, Burnham Thorpe, and finally coming in. Uh, uh, through Waterton, uh, that side of Walsall. And again, the idea was, much like Student Cross, that they, each group of men, uh, there were large, well, there were yes, entirely men that walked, um, had their own, their own route. But it was planned that they would arrive on the, the afternoon of the, or the evening of the 15th um, of July around Walsall. And each of them had their own campsite around the village. And as they arrived, um, they sent up uh, a rocket, a maroon, to signal that they'd arrived. Again, military precision. Um, and then when all 14 had been counted, another maroon went up from the slipper chapel itself to uh, signal the beginning of an all night vigil. And so they kept vigil. Uh, the whole night in prayer around their campfires uh, and then on the morning of the 16th these 14 crosses converged on the slipper chapel which was an amazing sight and loads of people came out to see it um, and then after um, a mass there they, they were carried um, down the holy mile in, in towards itself into the, the abbey grounds for, for a service there um, and there's tremendous um, archives of it, photographs and so on. And you can see the people who've come to see it who are actually kneeling in the street to see, to see these men carrying their crosses by. And if you look at the men, they're all, they've all got their boots around their, around their necks, they're barefoot. Having walked, you know, 200 and odd miles, they, they took their, their boots off to walk that last mile mile in, in their bare feet. I mean, I shouldn't bear thinking about the condition of their feet unless people in the 
1940s were more hardy. Of course, they were more hardy uh, than we are today, but it was a, a significant pilgrimage. And the crosses remained. They, they went back to the Slipper Chapel the following morning. Um, and they're now erected around what's called the meadow there, the open area, um, as an outdoor station to the cross. So they're, they're, still, they're still there. That was commemorated in uh, 1998 with a, a lovely uh, illuminated uh, manuscript. Um, and there was a, an icon painter who, who did a picture of each station, the actual event of the station, but against the backdrop of which cathedral it came from. Um, and then an account of the, the pilgrimage and a list of the men that were on the walk and, and the places that they went through. And that's on display uh, now at, at, uh, at the Slipper Chapel. So these are the two that came through here. Um, this is just the 12th station. Which came from Gossip. Um, and there is the crucifixion against the church that we left from. And there were reflections. I'm, I'm, Sorry, I'm not going to be able to read this to you because with the flash, my glasses, everything else. Um, but there are little reflections there because the men kept journals um, of, of their journey and, and uh, well, you know, their thoughts and what had happened to them there. And also, you're very welcome to come and look at this after the talk. There's also in the book um, copies of, of the actual photographs of the event uh, that there is. Yeah, so. And a list, as I say, of, of the men themselves. And there they are with their, with their cross. Yeah. And again, at the back there, you can see there are pictures of, of them coming to Walsall itself. And there are the various, the various routes that they, that they took converging, converging on. Traditions have continued in various ways. Um, as I say, when I when I walked the first time it was from Norwich because I was teaching at Notre Dame there, um, and we walked through the night. Actually, we set off from Norwich about uh, six o'clock, seven o'clock at night with um, teenagers, um, and we walked right right through the night uh, uh, towards uh, Walsall. And then uh, another time when I was in Peterborough, I took a group of youngsters there, and we, we actually started at Brandon and just did a two day walk uh, from, from there, which was enough for me <laughs> at the time. Yeah. But say, people do continue. Now, our, our own parish here in Lynn in, in, 19, in 2004, um, they organised uh, one and they, and they produced a nice little booklet with it, with a description of the route uh, and so on, <coughs> and prayers to say on, on their way. Uh, but the route that they took was slightly different <coughs> from the others. And what they did was they, they left um, Lynn at, um, at the hospital roundabout there, and then went down by way of um, towards Mint Lynn, um, and then across to the ruins of uh, St. James Church of Borsley, and then went by way of Grimston Warren, um, and for a long, uh, much of the, that sort of section of the route, it follows the old railway lines that are there. Um, the advantage of this particular route is it keeps you off, off the road um, largely as much as you can. So that goes by way of Grimston Warren, uh, Royden Common, Conham Heath, Little Massenham, Hartley, Hartley Common, uh, Grimsthorpe. Uh, Sherifford, Sculthorpe Mill, which sadly is closed. So um, one of the highlights of this uh, would, would probably be getting to Sculthorpe Mill in time for a pint at lunchtime. <laughs> um, but it would be sadly disappointed just at the moment. Uh, then Sculthorpe and uh, then West Barsham. Um, but of course now there's a brewery, uh, the, the Barsham Brewery, which uh, is an attraction. And then just in, dropping in then to, to the Slipper Chapel. So that's been a successful walk and has been, has been repeated uh, a few times uh, since, since then. And then uh, last year we had another a new group came. Um, this was a group who are particularly devoted to the old 
uh, Latin mass, the presenting mass. Um, and so they, they tend to be quite, uh, well they are, very, very traditional. Um, and uh, there was a group of young adults from the London area that in the uh, mid to late 20s, these, these people, uh, men and women, um, and they came and uh, they, they started <coughs> from our church on London Road um, with a mass at half past six in the morning uh, before, they, before they set off. Um, and they do, it, they do a two-day pilgrimage. Because they say it is at a stretch you can just about do it in a day uh, these days. Um, but they do two days. They, they go from, from Lynn uh, to Wooden. Um, and just this year, because they came again this year, the previous year I noticed that on their way to Wooden they'd gone all the way down Railway Road and all the way around um, you know, John Kennedy and, and all that way. You know, so this year I, I piloted them. I said, no, if you go across the walks, um, for a start you can see the Red Mount Chapel, which is amazing, and then follow the cycle path through, you know, on the way to, to standing on the Wooden, which is a much more pleasant um, way. So they were delighted at that that bit of local information. So yes, they go to Wooten, and then um, then they go to um, Royden, Grimston, Massingham, Hartley, um, and Birchen. And somewhere near Birchen, um, there's, there's a campsite, a permanent campsite, uh, with a brick facilities building uh, there. And so they, they spend the night there, um, and then from there go through Southbury and North Barsham. Onto the Slipper Chapel, um, so that that's been a successful one too. And that one also has the advantage of keeping them uh, off off the main roads um, as much as they can. So that's the problem these days. Um, there used to be a group used to come every year from Walsingham called the Guild of Our Lady of Ransom. Um, they didn't actually come through there because they went by way of Swatton and Faken and so on. Um, but in the end. They, they had to um, abandon the walk really because of the traffic, particularly in the area where they came past Mildrum Hall and Lake and Heath, mm -hmm. because that, that road there was, you know, was, was too dangerous to walk on really. And that, that's the case um, too um, with the route between here and, and Walsing uh, in the, uh, at present. This, this book. Um, It was written by um, a priest called Father Jimmy Collins from the North West. And when he retired, finally, at the age of 78, uh, he, he decided he was going to walk to Walsing from, from, um, from Holland, which is up towards Liverpool area. So he walked the entire way at the age of 78. He was only about, well, about five foot two, I think, or something like that he was, wildly chappy. And he is, but he came, he came through, um, through him. But he, he describes at one point um, going along, going along the the, the one four eight there. I'll just read this passage uh, to you. He says, "Meanwhile, I was trying to cope with the A one four eight, the road to Fakenham. There was no pavement." I was a helpless, frightened little rucksack man <coughs> facing the oncoming traffic as it passed near the distance of 12 inches to 24 inches away. Mm. Swish, swish, swish it went past, endless, without a break. I got a fleeting glimpse of grim faces huddled over steering wheels and other faces trapped inside the pressed steel boxes dressed in pressurised paint which hurled towards me and vanished. And I was out in the open air, where the sun was shining, and the grass was growing, and the birds were singing. And for all my fear, I would not have changed places. Despite that, along every border of this kind of road, which I walked in this long journey, there lay corpses of rabbits and squirrels and birds. I saw thousands of dead animals, and I'm not exaggerating. And I knew I could be another roadside statistic if I made the wrong move or a driver did. I wanted out of this deadly road to Fakenham, and after two and a half miles I turned left on a, onto a side road to West Newton, 
uh, on the edge of the Sunderland estate. Now I was moving in a different road and I was single. Um, so I think that, that's the sort of experience people have had, uh, trying, to, trying to walk along that way. And, um, and that's to say the present, present difficulty of, of getting out of the Dean um, is, is that, that little bit there. And I know the Student Cross, the, the group that goes by way of Ash Wickham these days, we actually have to transport them um, to Ash Wickham to start walking because it's so dangerous walking along the, the, the Borsi Road um, there for, for a group, um, especially a group moving slowly with a, with a, mm. with a big cross. Um, so that's a little, uh, a, a little problem with that. The whole idea of walking towards him again has, has, has um, I say, uh, um, resurfaced uh, and is beginning to be popular again. And there is a, a movement now to try and define uh, one or two routes um, which would be safe to walk along. And, and Paul and I have been involved in discussions uh, with Canon Peter Doll from Norwich Cathedral uh, and others to try and establish uh, away from from Lynn uh, towards them. And the idea is that eventually it would be waymarked to have permission from the local landowners to go across uh, their land, particular paths and so on. But it would be waymarked as well. Uh, and also there would be information given as to where people could get refreshment um, or even stay overnight. Uh, or the other idea we had was that we could integrate it with the um, local transport uh, as much as you can uh, in these areas but you know at intersections perhaps where, where there's a, a bus it's taken here it's taken um, that perhaps someone who didn't do want to do the, the entire walk at one go could do a section of it and get the bus back to, to Lynn and then perhaps another day get the bus back to the point where they they stopped and do a, another section so that that's all very much um, in the air at the moment, I think Paul is right yeah. to say. But um, that's part as well of a much bigger movement, which is to do with pilgrimage in the whole of Europe. Um, and again, connecting up the various pilgrim routes. Um, I think we're well aware of the famous route to Compostela to the Shrine of St. James in Spain, um, which began in various places, including England. Um, and also the route to Rome, again, which began in England, um, which pilgrims made uh, in, in olden times. Um, but apart, yes, it, an idea to, to have a sort of European network of, of routes, um, which would be a mixture, I guess, uh, of the traditional walking pilgrimage, but also these days of you know, pilgrimage that could be done on bicycles or even, um, even by, by, by cars and so on. So it's part of it, and, and, and so Lynn still has its its place in, in the in the great scheme of, of, of pilgrimage, and, and it's still an important um, starting point or hub, if you like, uh, for pilgrims uh, to, towards them. Um, even those who are not um, walking still come through the town. Our, our own church hosts various groups who are on their way towards them. Um, this week, in fact, we would have had a group from Wales, from North Gwent, um, who are hampered by the present situation. So they're, they're actually doing a, a virtual pilgrimage, and, and they've, they've kept their timetable of what they would be doing each day, their various activities, uh, and they wanted particularly to have the, the King's Lynn experience uh, mm -hmm. in, in their week. So the other night, um, I gave the talk as I normally give to pilgrims uh, from the Holy House uh, in, um, in Our Lady's Church. We, we, we're on YouTube now. And it's a wonder, we've, been, we've all been catapulted into, um, in, into modern technology and things that we, we knew we should have been doing years ago but never got down to it. And now we've been uh, sort of pushed in. So we're on YouTube now. If you go to YouTube, Our Lady's Kings Lynn TV, um, you, can, you can get up a talk, uh, a little pilgrim talk there from the on the shrine at uh, London Road. Um, the wonders of technology and indeed I think this is going out somewhere I'm not sure when, but uh, yeah, it's great. So I think that's that's all, uh, yes, that's all I've got to offer you, uh, but I'm very happy 
to, to take questions uh, as well. Thank you, Peter. Time to ask questions. Would anyone like to ask a question? Could you tell us something? Or tell me something about the um, the holy house that you have uh, in your church. In King's Inn. Yes, it's um, well. The original shrine at Walsingham was a, uh, meant to represent the holy house of Nazareth, where Gabriel came to Mary. Um, that was a little Saxon house. There was no attempt to imitate Palestinian architecture or anything. It was just a representative thing. Um, and so that was destroyed, of course. So in 1897, um, it was resolved to uh, re-establish the shrine, but there was nothing going on at Walsingham. There was no Catholic presence there. The Slipper Chapel was unused, as I say. Um, so the decision was made to build it in Lynn because Walsingham at that time was actually in the parish of King's Lynn, a huge parish in those days. Um, Big in area, but not big in numbers, obviously. Um, so while we were rebuilding uh, London Road, we decided to build on the side of it this copy of the Holy House. But this one was modelled on the one that's in Loretto, which is reputed to be the actual one from Nazareth, which had been taken by Crusaders because they were great at dismantling things and <laughs> putting them up somewhere else. Um, so it, it's a faithful copy of, of that. So in 1897 that was designated to be the restored shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham and until 1934 that was the official destination of pilgrims. Um, so now it's gone back as it were to being a station chapel on, on the way. Um, and it's known as the Pontifical Shrine because it was established by Pope Leo XIII who personally um, sanctioned it and personally chose and blessed the, the image that's, that's in there. Um, can I ask about going back to, Medi uh, to the 14th century and so on, you know, um, at the time when pilgrimages were very popular? Well, that's my question. My main question is um, how, how common, how popular was pilgrimages? Um, I mean, nowadays, sorry, in those days, religion um, was very much a centre of people's lives, where perhaps not so much now. So was it even then regarded as, well, one of those things that spiritual people do? Um, so that's a question. Um, all, also, um, was, it a was there a recognised route as it, uh, or destination that, yes, if you went on a pilgrimage, you would go... To, to Walsingham, and then you would perhaps go to Rome, and then um, so was it was it um, um, or did people say, well, no, we're only interested in going to Walsingham, or we are? And the last question, sorry, there's three. The uh, last <laughs> thing was, uh, um, did people go on pilgrimages purely um, to to um, confess, or you know, uh, were priests available for pilgrimages? to um, yeah, yeah. You know, take confessions or yeah. bless people or whatever. Yeah. Sorry, three yep, questions. Yep, yep. <laughs> if I can remember what three were. Um, <laughs> yes, it was, a, it was a, an enormously popular thing, pilgrimage. Yeah. Uh, and lots of people went on pilgrimage. Some to great shrines like Walsingham, but very often localities had their own little shrine. Right. Uh, or a holy well dedicated to a particular saint or something like mm -hmm. that. Like St. Whisburg as well at um, Beaver and what, mm -hmm. yeah. that sort of thing. People went to local ones. But then the Walsing was a preeminent uh, shrine in England. Um, it, was, it was one of the four major shrines in Europe. Right. So it ranked with uh, Jerusalem, Rome, Compostela, and Walsing. Right. And it attracted an international trade, which again really had a big part in because of the uh, contact with the continent. Yeah. So it was a hugely popular thing to do, yeah. and they went in great numbers right. um, as well, partly for, for um, safety, mm. because there were brigands about, and there were people who would rip you off, and people point you the wrong direction into a thicket or somewhere, and then mm. off your own head, you know. Yeah. Um, all it was, you know so for safety, uh, they went. Um, and this would have a destination, they would go to Walsingham, yeah. but they would try and clock up as many other shrines as they could on the way. Right. So 
the Rouge of Bromhall <laughs> was a very popular uh, uh, place to go, yeah. uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and it could be away for months. Yeah. 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 So much so that um, the church had to regulate it, and you had to be licensed. And you had to make your will, right. to make sure that you weren't absconding from your responsibilities, and make sure that you, you, your wife and children were looked after while you went. Oh, yeah. um, you make your will in case you died on the way. Yeah. Uh, you had to wear a particular habit, uh, a, a distinctive pilgrim's dress, right. and the gown, the grey gown, and you have a staff and a scrip, uh, what's it, and a, and a wide brimmed hat, yeah. on which, of course, you would collect all your tokens from your various shrines yeah. anyway. Yeah. Well, not as hypers do <laughs> these days, you know, the, the enamel badges you get in your, on your mm. bobble hat or whatever, yeah. um, much like that. Um, and before you left home, they read the burial service over you, oh. just, just in case, um, you know, anything happened to you and you didn't have yeah. the benefit of clergy as a leader. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it was also very seriously done. Yeah. And there were complaints that some people weren't going for the right reasons. Yeah. Because it was the early uh, package holiday. <laughs> um, and people were curious as to other destinations and things, you know, to town. You remember lots of people spent their entire life in their village, mm. in the fields around it. Yeah. You know, and to go to some exotic place that they'd heard about and they'd heard preachers talking about mm -hmm. and so on, um, it would be a, a big thing. Hollingshead, the, the Elizabethan chronicler, um, he puts the road to Walsham at first among all the, his list of roads in, in oh. the country. Um, and he said it was the duty of every, or it was considered to be the duty of every Englishman that he would make a pilgrimage to Walsham at least once uh, yeah. in, in his life. So it was a, a, a very significant thing, yeah. but as I said, there were people who, um, who, you know, saw the other side of it, and there were people just going along for the jolly. Um, and in the 14th century, we know there was a complaint made to the Archbishop of Canterbury that all these people were coming through and they were, you know, making a lot of noise and creating <laughs> <a> bad <laughs> image and this that, the other, and a lot of and singing and they had bagpipes with them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the Archbishop <coughs> said, well, you know, thank you. But he, he said, you're not really seeing far enough in this. He said, because um, they're having companionship and, and it's a hard journey. And so mm -hmm. they should, they should, you know, be able to entertain themselves and so on. So mm -hmm. he was you know, quite sort of uh, flexible about it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was amazing. I mean, it was the beginning of, of the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. In a lot of money on going around the tourist guide to have to tell them where's from ten minutes and people went back with them across the yeah. Yeah. They ran regular tourist galleries to the Holy Land where the Franciscans would pick them up and take them around. Mm. And even today the Franciscans people are still in. Yes, they have what's called the custody of the Holy Land, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Although they, they 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 do it very great. They when I went I, I went he's a thing discussion time. So I went to the Holy Land a couple of years ago, and I interestingly seen the Franciscans, but they wear their, their habits are brown. You know, well, okay, I thought they were going to be grey, but that's yeah. but um, but they're grey flags. That wasn't the same. No. Yeah, yeah. The three branches, and there's one one with brown, one with grey, one with white. Yeah, and uh, they had it's it's a real white grey flag, so they know they're also. But they didn't make them. They made a lot of money off. And in Lynn, the people were saying Lynn was sort of, and even today, Lynn was sort of like a, a very important hotspot for pilgrimage in terms of history and today. And the Pope is a chap called Peter, and there's a, there's a little secret entitlement in the news section. Quite a few people are old sighted in the news section. The news section is outside the section. It's a place called Peter Crane.
of the Red Mount Chapel in August. You sent them out by the East Gate yeah. and an associated chapel. Um, it was an attraction, basically. Oh. Um, the prior as it Margaret's having all these children coming through. Um, it could have been on, 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 uh, on this tree. Uh, so he built uh, this, this Red Mount Chapel. Constructed the lower chapel represents the Holy Sepulchre, the tomb of Christ. Indeed, the doorway on the right hand side is the tomb recess, uh, exactly as you'll find it in, in Jerusalem. Um, then in Jerusalem, you come out from the Holy Sepulchre, um, into this little tunnel really, you have to crouch through to get in and out. But equally, here you came out through the tunnel and went in and out of the tunnel, um, back outside the mount, then around. Creating there, right. um, and it was a very popular place. And the offerings um, at the altar there, because you recognise me, you, you, you know, you're a token of your, of your uh, devotion. Um, the offerings at that altar exceeded the sum of all the other altars in, in the town. Oh. Well. So there's a good little money center for the, for the fire <laughs> down the side. Yeah. 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 considered your Christian duty yeah. to support the pilgrims. The pilgrims came your way. It was, it was your Christian duty to make sure they were fed and housed and you know, had a big bandage or whatever. Yeah. That was a, a, a strict duty. So you could, you could rely, especially if you've got your pilgrim uniform on, yeah. the license by your bishop, uh, you could rely on the fact that you would be looked after uh, by the local, the local community. I thought to say it would be written up in the shop's mind, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, because the, the traders here would be written up 
probably the way that you'd have to do it. But, and, and good luck with, with that. Yeah, yeah. So that was the case in which you found that the Camino up to Santiago is the same. Mm -hmm. All these refugee things. Oh, well, that's, a, that's the, the, the most, the most travelled one. Yeah. Um, whereas the Fragicina doesn't have that kind of yeah. footfall. Well, there would have been similar here. Um, one route I didn't mention um, from, from then would, would go out to the Nile Valley. Um, if you were a little bit more wealthy, you could get a river taxi at, at the South Gates, which would take you the fair way of the Nile um, and save you an awful lot of walking yeah. um, up towards um, um, Castle Maker. Yeah. Um, yeah, so but all along this, all along the Nile Valley, if you look, get your map out and have a look, you'll see um, priories, remains of. Yeah. Abbey or Abbey Farm, or you can yeah. spot where all these communities, quite a lot of communities, up the length of the of the Nile Valley, and they would have all been places where pilgrims could stop um, on their way. And certainly going out, as I said, Flitcham, Coxford, um, uh, Scowcroft, there would have been small communities out there who would have been looking after pilgrims. So. Here's an awkward supplementary. How did you get back? Nobody ever talks about the way, coming, the way, the way coming, you came. Yes, <laughs> but was that as well organised? Um, well, it did. I, yes. 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 I mean, yes. yes. Come, certainly, people go in groups for safety. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, the, the way markers are all still there. You just bring yeah. them with them. Yes. Um, and certainly, again, on the way back, you know, they'd arrive at Lynn, they've had a successful pilgrimage um, at Walton. And they would certainly let their hair down here in the in the St. Adams and, and stuff. Uh, because you know, they were highly delighted with, with the success of the pilgrim. And buy their souvenirs, as I say, and, and perhaps they weren't too steady on their feet when they got on the boats yeah. and the last people had to drop the pilgrim. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean pilgrimage was a huge on the other side was a huge economic mm -hmm. yeah. in a place like Lynn, it was a very good place. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine when the bubble burst. Mm. Read, read William Richards' History of Lynn, 1812, when he talks about what Lynn must have looked like a few years after the closure of the priory, the devastation of the townscape. And mm. It's a very emotional but very dramatic It's like taking, writing. It's like taking five major factories out of the town. Yeah. 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 But I have to say as well, I mean, we've talked about this new route that, that's been devised and so on. Uh, there is a, a real sort of commercial angle to that too. I mean, it's been seen as part of promoting the, 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 the region and the area um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, tourism, hospitality, uh, and so on. And because um, it, it could be that some of the little hotels and places on, on the way will, will actually benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean, what the mutual benefit, um, but they would actually benefit from, from having pilgrims come past. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah commercial, and also good walking the health. Keep an eye then in a couple of meetings with Norfolk County Council initiated this, but everything was going quite well until key corona struck. And then we think, obviously, of Hong Kong now. I'm not sure what the future is for these things. It depends on the circumstances, I guess. But yes, um, Norfolk County Council have been involved with European people. I've, I've taken people around Lynn before the epidemic from Europe who are interested in Bolton, with English pilgrims. Because in Europe, as Peter says, they're also doing this and meeting up with you and walking doesn't for you, of course. And especially with the Dutch and the Germans. Anything else, final? But there isn't, I'd like to um, just uh, say next week, Lindsay Babin is speaking. Um, it's very strange, like, well, here we are. Sausage Saint, Wizards and Witches, King's Link Weird History. That's next week. And, um, also, I could do a quick advert for my talk, it's not really dark, Threats of Savage in the Industrial Revolution, Kingston Society of Arts and Sciences, on the 24th, that should be soon, if you're interested in that. Um, and um, we're still welcoming donations. <laughs> Rebecca will have a blue box through there, so if you've got any room to change, as a charitable trust, probably will always want to drop it into the don't worry, you're not, it's not good money after that. We've got a couple of pounds. We've been able to.
stabilise this grant, so we're not in danger of sinking, but we want to develop and build the museum up, especially next year, when it is 30 years old. And we're trying to do some special events for next year. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and supporting us, and especially to Peter, who did mention a good idea, he's sown the seeds of this idea, and two people he knows very well, I met them yesterday in the Hansa house, they asked me to join them for a pint, and I had to decline, but the savages, they said, well, why don't we organise a walk to Walsingham? Um, so there you are, perhaps we can organise um, a walk to Walsingham, for those of you interested, and um, raise some money um, for one or two things. And um, um, I have, Peter, I'm sorry, I haven't walked to Walsingham, the only one I've done, I did, in 1998, the centenary of the pilgrimage, I did walk to the Slipper Chapel for the Abbey Grounds with a group of people, including Cardinal Basil Heath. That was a very interesting conversation with him last night as they down to the, the Abbey Grounds. That was when I was the mayor, so I was at the front of this uh, procession. And um, Peter has today, as he mentioned, um, um, a friend of ours, a Peter of ours, Tim McDonald, um, uh, for health reasons, and so we're very grateful to Peter in particular for standing in and um, doing a topic which I know he likes doing anyway, but for coming along um, to support us, as he has done in several times in the past, so thank you very much for that, and for giving an interesting talk, and um, Peter, what I hope will come from your two talks today is that there'll be, once King Karuna disappears, we can do something mm -hmm. more about walking and make the Lynn again the centre of pilgrimage walking and routes. And maybe we can get a, a, a partnership through um, St Mary's on London Road and Trujard on a Walsing and Walk. Wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Peter. Right. I'll leave this at the door for you. It's, it's actually the route that Father Jimmy did. Um, so you're welcome to take one of these. Yeah. And, 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 Thanks, Peter. Thank you.